Okay, so let me introduce, we have Dr. Annie Gupta from UCLA, who is a neuroscientist and expert on neural paths to overeating. Deborah Cohen, a senior physician policy researcher at RAND and author of A Big Fat Crisis. Emerin Mayer, professor at UCLA and author of The Mind-Gut Connection. Janet Tomiyama, associate professor uh, here at UCLA in the Department of Psychology and an expert on stigma and obesity. And Barbara Luraya, who is a professor at UC Berkeley, an uh, uh, epidemiologist and nutritionist. So what, what do we know about psychological stress? We know very well, starting from work by, starting with Kelly Brownell, um, that stress causes some people to eat less, and some people to eat more. Chronic work stress in population-based studies leads to greater abdominal fat over years and obesity, and in a smaller subset of people leads to weight loss. That's typically when they start off uh, lean. So at a biological level, we know that sh stress shifts our dietary preferences to seek highly palatable food changes our fat cell metabolism so that we are storing more fat and becoming more pro-inflammatory. What you're gonna hear now are about new findings uh, at different levels of analysis on psychological stress. We're going to s demonstrate these findings with a case study. This is a conglomerate person. Her name is Maria. She is not of a specific ethnicity or race because these issues cross race, ethnicity, and besides food insecurity, they also stress has these pervasive effects regardless of social economic status. So meet Maria, and I will start by handing this to um, Dr. Gupta, who is going to tell us a little bit about uh, early historical factors in Maria's life that, are, that have shaped her um, her response to eating. And I just want to say that uh, historical factors are, are, cannot be ignored. We cannot understand a person without understanding both their context and their history. So I'm going to talk about Maria. She was exposed to ne neglect and abuse as a child and um, was de lived in a deprived and dangerous neighborhood. So I'm going to talk about how early life adversity helped develop her reward network. So neuroimaging studies have shown that a higher BMI is associated with alterations in functional gray matter morphology, white matter properties, kind of suggesting a possible role of the brain in the pathophysiology of being obese, but maybe even possibly overweight. These studies largely implicate regions of the core and extended reward network, which are involved in processing rewarding stimuli, but also in integrating salient information in order to make decisions about food intake. The reward model suggests that similar to addiction models, repeated exposure to highly palatable food cues results in alterations in responsiveness of the dopamine-rich reward system, leading to behaviors that override homeostatic needs and causing increased hedonic ingestion and possibly obesity. There is now growing evidence to the possibility of the long-term effects of early adversity. For example, changes in overall food availability, whether it's malnutrition or overnutrition, or limitations in selected nutrients, macronutrient and mineral deficiency during early childhood can alter cell structure and metabolism, which reprograms the stress responsiveness mainly through the HPA axis. We also know that it's possible that early adversity due to brain plasticity in a child leads to increased vulnerability later in life to develop hedonic ingestion and obesity. In other words, early in life, the brain gets shaped in terms of stress responsiveness later in life. So during adulthood, with increased risks, such as exposure to stress factors, may further lead to disruptions in the reward network. For example, we've seen various studies that have shown increased amygdala activity and blunted medial orbital frontal activity to do food cues. In fact, stress affects food choices, potentially driving overconsumption of energy. Chronic stress also alters inflammatory processes, glucose metabolism, and insulin resistance. Together, these processes also affect other negative health outcomes, such as mood and anxiety. 
So what we did to test this model, we performed a tripartite <coughs> network analysis based upon graph theory. We wanted to show how early <coughs> adversity increases vulnerability to negative effects of stress on reward network connectivity and hedonic ingestion leading to obesity and other negative health outcomes later in life. We used resting state network metrics measuring centrality, which basically means the flow of information in these regions, and we specifically focused on core and extended reward regions. We found that in high BMI group, compared to the normal BMI group, increased positive associations were found both with early adversity and stress with various reward regions, and we also saw increased positive associations between hedonic eating and measures with um, reward regions, including the thalamus and the putamen, and increased positive associations between salience regions and the nucleus accumbens and negative health outcomes as measured by the PHQ and SF12. Hi. So um, <coughs> what I want to talk about are retail food environments, which are very problematic for everyone, but they're particularly uh, a problem for people with fewer economic resources, like Maria. And that's because supermarkets and grocery stores are designed to encourage impulse buying of low-nutrient foods. Junk foods are aggressively marketed with discounts, and they're placed in prominent locations all over the store so they can't be avoided or ignored. And these create multiple distractions which can overwhelm people and undermine their intentions to, to stick to a healthy diet. So uh, we did an audit of 52 grocery stores and uh, just on average, a typical supermarket has about 12 aisles or 24 aisle displays, 24 end aisle displays, 30 floor displays, eight cash register displays, and the four perimeter walls. And so that's 90 different locations where you find uh, food you know, in the store. And we documented where was the sugary beverages and the junk food. Well, there's sugary beverages on 25 of those displays and junk food in 40. So just the end all displays, about a quarter of them have sugary beverages and almost half have junk food. That's you know chips, candy, sweetened baked goods, frozen desserts. And on the cash register, I'm sure you know, it's over 90% of them have junk food and uh, two thirds have sugary beverages. And so when we see these low quality foods everywhere in the environment, it, it normalizes them as part of our everyday diet when these foods really need to be consumed rarely. And, and the problem is because there's so many products in the stores, it leads to decision fatigue. Now everyone has a limited cognitive capacity, but as you just heard, people with lower uh, um, economic resources are already stressed and they're already carrying a higher cognitive load. And that makes them more vulnerable to these displays in supermarkets. And um, also, the choices of low-income people are much more difficult than it is for people with resources. So for example, if you only have 20 bucks to spend on groceries and you really need to spend 25 or 30, that means you have to make a lot of decisions about what to take and what to leave. These are decisions that wealthier people don't have to make. And these decisions are difficult and they tax whatever limited capacity is already uh, available. And so when people at their, are at their limits of decision making, they revert to automatic choices and uh, they're more likely to choose things that look like a bargain or are convenient or you know, have more sugar or more calories. Um, and so restaurants are also a problem because most restaurants are serving extra large portions that have more calories than most people can burn. And uh, when people eat away from home, they generally eat more calories, like 130 to 250 more calories than they would if they ate the same food at home. And so um, we need to think about how to reduce the burden of retail food environments that everyone has to overcome to eat a healthy diet. I'm very skeptical that we'll be able to train people to transcend the limits of cognitive capacity. And because of that, we need to think about how to redesign our grocery stores and st establish standards for restaurants so people have the option of getting food that won't increase their risk of a chronic disease or that their easy choice will be the healthy choice. Thanks. So being interested both in the brain and in the gut, um, I thought it would be important to remind the audience that um, these processes of making choices um, and 
um, being under, under stress are not just limited to the brain, but also affect uh, what goes on uh, in our gut. And that there's very important players that we have in our gut that uh, s we have now evidence that seems to be playing an important role in, in making this uh, circular connection between the brain, the body, and back to the brain. So under chronic stress, we've heard in the, in the, in the, in the previous talk, um, um, food insecurity is a major source of, uh, of chronic stress, toxic stress, or allostatic load. Um, we, uh, we know that this plays an important role in unhealthy food choices, so-called comfort food. These unhealthy food choices have in common that they're low in fiber, high in unhealthy <coughs> fats, and high in sugar, uh, and they are cheap. Um, so the consequence is that um, um, these foods are not just play a role in our metabolism and gaining weight, but they also cause a st um, major fundamental changes at the gut level. Um, the gut is a complex organ, as you can see here, composed of not just a coat of muscle cells, but the um, largest part of our immune system, largest part of our, oh, this is, the largest part of our uh, endocrine system, and a, uh, the second largest part of our nervous system, all in the gut, interacting with 100 trillion um, um, uh, uh, microbiota, um, microorganisms that live there and interact with it. These unhealthy food choices we know from a lot of studies have a major effect on the composition um, and on the products that these microbes produce. And sorry if there's some of this automatic thing in there. Um, <coughs> Just to mention a couple, um, these food choices lead to a decrease in a particular species of microbiota that stimulate the gut to pr produce mucus. Um, the gut becomes, the, the barrier function of the gut becomes compromised, uh, and there's an immune activation um, that then um, can have significant effects on, 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 on the rest of the body. Also, th uh, the microbes <coughs> produce um, a very large number probably hundreds of thousands of so-called metabolites, many of which are neuroactive substances that are very similar to neurotransmitters that we make, our own nervous system makes. Um, and some of these metabolites can be released um, either in the gut, acting on these various cells in the gut, or they can be uh, released um, into the systemic circulation. Uh, and um, basically, some of them go back to the brain, depending on how much they go th are able to go through the blood-brain barrier. So the stress leads to these food choices. The food choices lead to these changes in, um, in, um, in, in microbial composition and function and in their products that then, um, some of which can actually feed back to, to, to the brain, to these reward centers that Annie mentioned earlier, um, and change the food preferences. So there's some pretty exciting evidence from patients undergoing bariatric surgery that um, after this procedure not only change their gut microbes and their metabolites, but also change their brain connectivity in the reward system, um, and also very selectively change their food preferences, no longer craving for high sugary and high fat foods, but still having normal appetite for other foods. So we have pretty good evidence both from animal studies and from um, a smaller number of human studies that these substances produced by the microbes in response to the unhealthy diet um, and changes in the gut barrier, the so-called leaky gut concept, um, can have a major effect on, on the reward system driving these, further driving these unhealthy food choices. So it's, it, it becomes a vicious cycle, starting with the stress uh, and ending up with a enhanced craving for unhealthy food ch choices that reinforce the system over and over. Okay, so we've talked a lot so far about how stress might cause obesity, but what we haven't talked about yet is how obesity itself is a really stressful state. So think about Maria, for example. She might get snide comments even from people close to her, like her family members, about her weight. Uh, she might get dirty looks from people on the airplane as she walks down the aisle. Uh, she might 
have to deal with many TV shows and mass media saying incredibly mean things about heavy people with seemingly no pushback from society. And so I've dedicated one part of my research to documenting just how uh, stressful this, this uh, experience of weight or obesity stigma is and what the consequences of somebody living in such a really um, anti-fat bias society might be. And so I'm going to describe just one study to you. This was done with um, my graduate student, Angela Inkalinko Rodriguez, who I think is here somewhere. Um, so you heard about cortisol, and you heard about the HPA axis. Uh, cortisol you might know uh, as a, the stress hormone. But one thing cortisol also makes your body do is it makes you deposit um, fat in your belly region or your visceral region. And so cortisol as a stress hormone is something that's really relevant, I think, to this conversation of obesity. So uh, in this study, what we wanted to do was <clears throat> prove to everybody scientifically that experiencing weight stigma is actually stressful, and stressful in a way that is um, harmful to your body. And so what we, we set out to do was a randomized controlled experiment where we exposed people to either be stigmatized for their size or not, and then we measured their cortisol levels. And so it was called the psychology of shopping study. So it sounded like it would be really fun to be in. It was not. Um, so participants arrived in our lab. There was a room set up with lots of fun looking clothing and pop music really blaring out of this room. And we said, we're really interested in the effects of shopping in groups on uh, hormones. And so we're gonna have you shop in a really big group. It's gonna be fun. But first we have to make sure that you'll fit into the clothes that, that we have for you. And so we then weighed them and measured them had them wait in a waiting room sitting on a couch next to a very thin uh, person who they thought was another participant in the study. In fact, they were a confederate working with our lab. And we beckoned to the thin confederate and said, great news, you've qualified for the shopping study, you can go into that other room. And then we turned to our participant and we said, unfortunately, your shape and size just aren't ideal for this type of clothing and we really need everyone to have fun and feel good and so um, we're gonna have you do this other online shopping thing. So they were rejected from the shopping experience ostensibly because of their size. Now this was random assignment, so in fact it had nothing to do with their actual size. We just wanted them to experience what it was like to experience weight stigma. And sure enough, for the people who thought of themselves as heavy or overweight, these, these women exhibited a higher cortisol levels than the people who were in the control group who weren't experienced to weight stigma. And so this is just sort of a proof of concept to show you that these social experiences that we have are very stressful. And we know from my research and others that weight stigma also not only increases cortisol but causes people to eat more. Work out of Kelly Brunell's lab has shown this as well. Uh, we know that experiencing weight stigma undermines your motivation to exercise because who would want to put on some Lululemon and go to the gym <laughs> after someone's just teased you for being heavy? And so what you might be realizing at this point is that there's another vicious cycle happening here where you are heavy and so you experience weight stigma. The stress of that weight stigma can cause cortisol increases, eating increases, all sorts of things that can cause you to gain more weight and that puts you at even more risk for weight stigma. And so it's a vicious cycle and so no wonder it's so hard to be able to you know, get out of this cycle of obesity. Okay. Now, the last slide, we skipped over it. Maria's pregnant. And what does this mean? What does it look like to be a pregnant woman in, in the United States? Um, first of all, we know that over 50% of pregnant women begin pregnancy overweight or obese, which has huge implications for both the mom and the baby. We've used um, NHANES data to look at the prevalence of food insecurity among pregnant women, and <coughs> almost 25% of pregnant women report food insecurity at some level, either worrying about having enough food or a more severe level, like Dr. Liang spoke of. And this is regardless of whether they're participating in WIC. We saw the same pattern in California using the maternal infant uh, and uh, interview survey data. 
28% of pregnant women report food insecurity during pregnancy. And this is far too common of an occurrence for pregnant women. So food insecure pregnant women, what do they experience? Well, they report much higher scores on um, perceived stress, anxiety, depression, and disordered eating. They go on to gain, um, they start pregnancy heavier, they gain more weight during pregnancy, and they are at over twice the odds of uh, developing gestational diabetes. Not good news, not good news for the mom and her mm -hmm. future health trajectory or the infant. In the MIHA data that I spoke of, we asked women about their life events during pregnancy, and 78% of food insecure women reported having one or more major life event occurred during pregnancy. That means that they were either divorced during pregnancy or suffered major depression, their, their partner lost their job, she lost her job, she had low social or emotional support, they also reported high levels of um, neglect and also homelessness. So we're seeing that food insecurity also has with it a host of other social stressors. So what does this mean, and especially what does this mean for the baby? So food insecurity, as Dr. Leung pointed out, is associated with uh, higher odds of low birth weight it's actually two and a half times um, higher odds of um, low birth weight. But we also know that babies can be born normal weight but fatter. And all these stressors end up putting children on a trajectory of developing insulin sensitivity and chronic disease in adolescence and during adulthood. So we need to really focus on the mom and um, make sure that there's healthy spaces for these women.